Okay, let's bring that volume down. <coughs> okay. Oops. Whoo, okay. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. Today we're going to be making another painting by another one of my all-time very favorite artists. Are we really going to do... Okay. <laughs> we are going for the stars today. We are going for arguably the greatest painter of all time. Maybe not the most famous painter. Probably some an artist maybe some people have never heard of. But within the art world, and especially during the time he was alive, he was the greatest living artist anywhere on Earth. Or at least to the people in the Western world who didn't know anything outside of that space. We are going to be talking about the amazing, the great Titian, or Tiziano. Titian was a Venetian artist from Venice, Italy, and he created some of the greatest paintings of all time. He's a sort of considered a, I guess, a late Renaissance painter. He was a contemporary of Michelangelo. Uh, he would have been alive uh, during the latter half of Leonardo da Vinci's life, and uh, yeah. <laughs> So this is, I, I as I was getting ready for today's episode, I'm like, why are we do? Why am I doing this to myself? Because this is going to be um, one of those like we're really we're tackling the the big dog here, right? And you may have said like, oh, we've done Vermeer, we've done Leonardo, absolutely. Those were some uh, challenging paintings, and and I don't think today's painting is going to be especially difficult. It's just <laughs> the idea of 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 me trying to do a Titian painting is uh, it, uh, shows either some uh, ridiculous arrogance on my part or stupidity. Um, so let's get right into it. This is the painting that we're going to be painting today. This is uh, the portrait of Danielle Barbaro. And there is two versions of, of this painting which exist. This actual painting that we see here is in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Ottawa, Canada. And you could argue that this is the greatest painting in, in a Canadian collection, museum, private collection, or otherwise. It would certainly be, you know, it's, it's not a painting by a Canadian, but it would certainly... I mean, arguably trump every other painting uh, by any other artist in a Canadian collection. And so let's let's actually just sort of, I want to dive in, I want to talk about Titian's life. We're obviously going to make today's painting. Um, so let's, uh, I'll let you know that I've done an outline for today's painting. There's this uh, tracing that I did using my iPad Pro and the Procreate app. And I did that, I uploaded it to the Dropbox, and there's a Dropbox folder. Let's take a quick look at that. You'll see in this Dropbox folder, there's a link in the description below. You'll see other, th like Leonardo da Vinci, 
right in here. Who would be another? <laughs> like, um, I think the Soba Singh, this portrait uh, we did there, that, that would be kind of similar to what we're going to do today. Uh, oops, we did a, a hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can see as we go down here, there's lots of paintings. If you're wondering, you want to try something different, we've got everything from a cubist painting here to Spider-Man to abstract paintings. Marcel Ferran, I actually put on a blindfold to make that painting. Lots of landscape paintings here. Uh, a couple hockey themed ones <sighs> even Peppa Pig right so <laughs> all the way across the spectrum so we click on Titian down here you're gonna see three files in there basically you've got two versions of the outline one's a JPEG and a PDF this is the JPEG version and then of course the original itself so um, let's I wanted, let's just talk really briefly about his biography. Um, maybe even before I jump into that, I'll let you know that there's a private Facebook group just for people that are painting along with me, and hopefully that's you today. And in this Facebook group, you're gonna find images by people like yourself who are painting along and uploading their finished version of the painting to the Facebook group so that people, we can celebrate it and we can also give you feedback on how to make it even better and there it's a pretty active group a super supportive group if you're a beginner artist and you want to a community of people that are that are rising up with you um that are that have been there and done that there's some some people who've been painting with me for over a year now and some people who just joined last week right so you can you can paint any of the paintings we've done this is painting 119 so you can paint any of those put them up on the Facebook group and you'll get about a hundred people who've made that exact painting and can give you some feedback on or just empathize with the challenges involved therein so lots of great stuff here oh this is exciting here's Gemini you know reworked a painting based on my feedback here that's so cool but I won't look at that right now because every month I go through the Facebook page, I call all the images, and then we spend about three or four hours going through them individually and giving you feedback on there, right? So that's another reason why you want to join that Facebook group. Okay. So let's look up Tiziano Vicelli, <laughs> otherwise known as Titian, and, or at least in the English world, Titian. Sometimes it's spelt with a Z instead of a T, the second, so you might see that a few places. Tizen, um, and we, we don't we don't really know exactly when he was born and he himself fudged that date to make himself often older than he actually was i'm not exactly sure why he did that um but you know he i think he said he was born in 1474 which would make him closer to about like 95 when he died he um, didn't really come from a, a creative background at all. His parents um, were, he, it was most of his family were notaries, like, like a notary public. Um, and he, when he was young, was and his brother were both sent off to Venice to apprentice with the painter Bellini, right? You've probably had a Bellini to drink, but there is... The, the name comes from a very famous Venetian artist, Giovanni Bellini. And um, uh, so he apprenticed with Bellini. And while he was in, in Venice, Venice, Italy, I mean, even till relatively recently, was the, the center of global trading. Right, Venice, Italy was where boats came from Asia, from Africa, even from what was just said the New World, the Americas at the time, and and uh, all and and the Mid East, all all over, not just from the water, but from land routes. So it was this major. Tr it was the biggest trading capital of the world at the time, and so you know what we. How would you even like what would be the the comparison today would be 
you know, a place like Los Angeles or Vancouver or, you know, London, England, you know, like a major trading center, right? And that allowed him access to lots and, and that, you know, a center like that pulls in all sorts of people, uh, especially lots of creative people looking for opportunities, right? So he befriends all of these these artists who are now legendary artists, Lorenzo Lotto, uh, Francisco Vicelio, <laughs> and Giorgio da Castafranco, who is most well known as Giorgione. I just love saying Italian names. I love, I've been to Venice a few times. I love Venice. You, if you haven't been, you've got to go. It's a great city. You got to go before it is, you know, it might be gone. You know, it's it's slowly sinking or the waters are slowly rising. I think both is happening. So there's, that's a whole other conversation we can have throughout today's episode. Um, and, and actually he becomes such good friends with Giorgione that the two of them collaborate on paintings together. Uh, which is not unusual, which, which I guess is a little bit unusual. Often around this time you'd have a master and an apprentice. And so you'd have somebody like Bellini who would begin a painting and then Titian would come in and work a little bit on that painting and then Bellini would come back and finish the painting and sell it as his own, as Bellini's painting. So that was, that's very, I mean, there's still many artists today that do that. Uh, Jeff Koons and Damien Hirst, you know, big artists that have like a, essentially a factory of people, Andy Warhol, speaking of the factory, would have people working for him and doing things for them, right? The little bit of the, the twist here is Giorgione um, collaborated with Titian. So you have two young artists who would work on on each other's paintings, you know, literally trading the back and forth to the point where to, to today we're not really even sure who painted what. And a lot of actually Giorgione paintings that were ascribed to Giorgione at one point are now said to be Titian paintings. Probably because Titian is the more famous name. Um, I would so if you wanted to sell something and you could kind of get away with saying it's a Titian, you could probably make a couple dozen millions more on the sale. Or maybe you know some of these paintings are literally for sale for two or three hundred million dollars. <clears throat> so the stakes are pretty high when it comes to attribution of artworks. Um, I have so much I want to say. I'm going to say some of this stuff while we're painting. You will see, uh, there's going to be a few paintings here that are maybe not safe for work, if you've heard that term before. I'll try to glaze over that, but Titian is also very famous and over the past maybe 50 years become kind of controversial for his nude paintings of women. And... Um, and he's been seen as sort of the poster boy for these very sexualized depictions of nude women. And he wasn't the first one to do that, but he definitely made a career out of doing that, amongst other things. One of the great things with Titian is that he could do anything. He could paint portraits, he could paint nudes, he could paint historical paintings of, of major battles or coronations of kings and queens. He could paint scenes from the Bible or from Greek mythology. I mean, whatever it was, Titian could do it. He's also very, he's famous for painting portraits of kings and queens, uh, nobles, noble men, some noble women, um, uh, with based on other people's paintings. So sometimes he would get a commission, a letter would come in the mail and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm such and such a king from uh, Rome or Florence. I'd love, since you're the most famous artist of today, I would love it if you made my painting. Now, since <laughs> um, uh, Venice and Florence are at war right now, it's kind of inconvenient for me to come over your studio and get painted. But there is a painting of mine at so-and-so's house. Could you go down there and make a, a version of that painting in your style and then send it to me? And he would do that, and his version would be 
way better than the original painting. And if anything, that king or queen or whatever would look at, would be like, how did you do this? How did you... You've never even seen my face. You, you took this portrait by somebody else, did your version of it, and it's even better, and it's more like me. Like, we're talking... A, it's almost magic, right? It's... it's he blew people's minds. So let's just, I'll just kind of, we'll talk about his biography as we go here. But here's just kind of a, a quick sampling of some of his paintings. And I know for some people will look at this and their eyes kind of glaze over and be like, okay, yeah. Kind of looks like a lot of paintings from the past, right? Like, what? I don't really know what's so special about these, Michael. The thing is, is basically a lot of modern art or paintings that, that were made around this time and afterwards were uh, were almost directly copied from Titian. Titian is like the guy who established the template that everybody, even up until this moment today, are still following. So it's yeah, there's a lot of stuff that kind of looks like that this out there in the world. But this is ground zero. This is the guy that kind of established a, 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 a format, composition, color palette, uh, technique, painting technique, which we'll talk about here shortly. So it is like, it's kind of hard to... <laughs> uh, over like it's it's hard to overstate the impact that this person had on art history and then you know because art history is intertwined with other like economic history spiritual religious history how he affected the entire world uh so this is the page in the national gallery showing this painting uh but i thought it would be interesting for us to flip quickly back and forth between these this is a painting with the same title that's in the Prado Museum in Spain. And this this is acknowledged as a Titian painting. And it's been on display for hundreds of years, celebrated as a great painting. And no question about its authenticity. We know that this is by Titian. And then this painting was floating around for, you know, 500 years. It was bought, um, I'm not even, I don't know the exact um, provenance of the painting, but it was bought um, in or by a Canadian, or it somehow ended up in the National Gallery's collection around 1930, 1928 and 29, somewhere around there. And it was long thought to be a poorly done copy of the original. And... Um, it wasn't until 2003 where the National Gallery of Art in Canada did a restoration of the painting, took off all of these varnishes that were on top. Remember, we've talked about varnish a few times and how varnishes are used to protect a painting. Well, there were layers and layers of varnish on this painting and they were removed and then the painting was x-rayed and this painting, which looked really yellow and kind of unspectacular and would, had probably been touched up many, many times, through the, the varnishes, we were able to remove all that and get back to the original painting. And the curators and restorers at the National Gallery, who, who then were in touch with, the, the, with many, many people across the world, including people at the Prado and Spain, looked at it and were shocked they realized not only is this a painting by Titian, that Titian, in fact, made this painting first and then made this copy based on the one at the National Gallery of Canada. Um, and so it's kind of maybe hard maybe for people to maybe to see the difference here. But one of the things that I notice about this painting is that this painting is is maybe a little bit more carefully done than this painting. And it doesn't surprise me because essentially what we know about this painting, the, the Canadian version, is that he did 
he was drawing and moving things around on the on the canvas. Uh, Titian didn't really do much sketching. He would literally just start drawing or painting directly onto the canvas. So there is, in the x-rays of this, lots of little subtle changes as he was trying to figure out exactly how to make this painting. And then he made, once he figured that out, it made the second version of the painting that fairly straightforward. He's like, okay, I, I know the, the way that this person is supposed to be sitting, the kind of look on their face. Boom, I can just knock another copy off, right? So that makes this painting particularly precious because not only is it by Titian, but we, we can understand a little bit about his working process through this painting. It, it's sort of like a key that unlocks his process and gives us insight into the artist himself. Um, let me see. I have just a bunch of links here. Like, so here's x-rays where we can see a little bit of, of some movement in the painting. Um, I can't remember if there's another image down there. Uh, all of these links are in the description below. Okay, so let's let's dive into the painting and start making this artwork. So <clears throat> we're gonna do something a little bit different today because Titian had a unique way of working. So Titian is known to have painted directly onto white uh, canvas or panels. So unlike many artists of his time and since, he did not put a colored ground down. And if you've been painting with me for the past year, you know that one of the very first things that I do is put some yellow down onto the canvas. So I'm not going to do that today, even though I kind of want to. I've been thinking about it over the course of the day, and I thought, you know what, let's just really, let's dive in and do, attempt to do Titian as Titian um, did it himself so I'm just gonna move this up so that hand isn't right at the bottom try to center it right in the middle maybe I'll move it a little bit over again I don't mind if oops let's let me show show you what I'm doing here so I'm gonna move this I don't mind if the the back gets cut off a little bit in fact I'll move it right up to the edge I'd, I'd much rather have more space on his hand if possible we'll put that down now i'm usually i try to do these outlines before the episode begins as you may hear in my voice i've been very sick the past week so i'm just barely holding it together so i'm just going to use this carbon paper to Right, this is the material that I'm using, this carbon paper. How, uh, how about I'll just put that on the screen here. So carbon paper is really useful for transferring images. You could also use graphite paper. I've also shown how you can do this exact thing without uh, any carbon paper at all. You could rub some charcoal or graphite onto the back side of a printout and then you could now that should probably be centered I might redo that we'll see now that I just did that I'm like huh that was kind of a bonehead move the background is pretty dark so it'll be very easy to hide that So I'm not going to take very long at all to do these outlines because I just want this on here to establish the composition, basically where roughly where these eyes are, where the ear is. You know, this would be about as close to the Mona Lisa as you could find in Canada. 
right? It is also very interesting to me that no one cared about this painting for, you know, a hundred years while it sat in the storage in the basement of the National Gallery. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, it's by Titian. And then all of a sudden people get excited and now it's like on the walls and in the guidebooks for the city of Ottawa, must see. It goes to show how important a name recognition is in art, right? And how fickle people are. Uh, there's plenty of names throughout art history which are, have now become virtually forgotten. You could even say Titian himself, right? As I said, probably most people watching this have never even heard of him. Um, but if you're a painter, I think this is the artist you want to be having a conversation with. So I think I'm going to just erase, can I erase this at all? See if I can move this into the center. Maybe I'll raise it up a little bit higher. Just so I'm not going right over his head. Hmm. That's not too... Let's go even further here. Hmm. You'll ha again. You'll have to excuse me. I'm I'm doing my best not to sniffle into the microphone, but uh, it's either have a little bit of a cold and make today's painting. I can already feel my voice giving out <clears throat> a bit, or. Uh, or not do today's episode at all, and I'm a, I'm, um, I'm a uh, fanatic for a routine, and if, I got, if I'm on a routine, I want to keep my routine. Okay, so you can see, like, you know, I didn't get the whole nose in there, I'm not really concerned about that. Okay. See lots of comments in the chat there. There's Joshua says, another day, another idea I will put on the canvas, and I'm doing two paintings, a Monet and a Fox. Oh, cool. So you're doing two paintings, Joshua. That's exciting. I can't wait to see them on the Facebook group there. And there's Carla says, hello from Lima, Peru. Hi, Carla. Welcome to the show. Paula says, hi, Carla, as well. And Heidi says, hi, everyone. Welcome, Carla. And Michael, or Paula says, Michael, you sound better than yesterday. <laughs> That's good. We'll see. As today's episode goes on, my voice may give out a little bit. I'll try to keep myself as hydrated as possible. Okay. So, as I said, today's painting, unlike, you know, about a hundred of the paintings you've done in the past, I am not going to put my trademark warm yellow onto the canvas. And, and so I guess the natural question is, and I'm not going to do that because Titian is sort of known for not doing that. I've been thinking about why, why did Titian not do put a colored ground? We know that he mostly painted directly onto white canvas or probably would have been slightly off white, probably wasn't as, as bright as this. So I was even thinking maybe I'll paint this, give it a bit of an eggshell color. And then I think, you know what, let's just... You know, let's just paint right on here like this, which again is is different than than sort of part of the method I've been teaching. And so anyway, the why did Titian not put a colored ground, as was very typical, right? Him not doing that. The only reason, the only people that were not using colored ground were often artists who were doing um, fresco painting. Fresco painting is when you're painting on a wall. And the way that you, you, you paint on a wall during the Renaissance time is that you would put wet plaster down, right? Like literally, like, you know, if you have to fill a hole, you know, you, you 
you make a hole in the wall and you're you're moving out of your apartment and you fill it with a little bit of plaster right and then you sand it and then you paint over it right that's essentially wet plaster you scoop it out you you'd spread it onto the wall and while it's wet you're painting on it really quickly and plaster is sort of like a white a little bit grayish kind of color and you know that's the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo is a fresco right a lot of the great Renaissance paintings were painted on walls because painting on on canvas or panel was pretty rare was expensive and often the you know wood panels would warp and crack and if they if if the wood warped the paint on top of it would crack and crumble and literally fall off right so it was pretty uncommon for artists to paint on anything but walls for a long time right uh, you'd only do it if you you were pretty certain that that surface you're painting on was was stable and secure and wasn't going to do too much flexing or bending that it had to be stored in a relatively um, even temperatured space etc long story so I th a part of me thinks the reason why Titian when he wasn't he did a few murals and frescoes some of them are huge and very famous I think he he liked that look of, of bright color, which is what he's really known for. If I just kind of go back here really quickly. Um, let me see if I can find a painting of his, that is like one of these giant frescoes. Um, like this one, where's an even more famous one? going to be sitting here okay so here's the assumption of the version this is a very famous <clears throat> fresco by um, uh, by Titian and one of the features that Titian is is known for and and known so well for is that he 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 basically threw him the the, the what is known as the Venetian school of painting is established and one of the main features of Venetian art is very bright, saturated color. And part of that, uh, well, um, the, probably the main reason is, like I said right at the top, Venice is the, the center of, of virtually commerce on earth, right? And so any, and pigments, artists at this time, you know, put in an order for for blue and red and yellow and green and somebody has to go to the ends of the earth to find those right the blue that we use today this warm blue just to give you an idea this is essentially the synthetic version of ultramarine blue ultramarine blue real ultramarine blue comes from only a few quarries in Afghanistan so if you were living 500 years ago and you wanted to use this color, someone would have to go digging in a mine in Afghanistan and pull out these little tiny rocks of blue, take a boat or a, a camel and ride all the way back to wherever you are. Then you take it in your studio and you grind it up. And you're talking about, you know, like, let's say you have this little jar of crushed pigment that could cost a year's salary. And so you might split this little jar of ultramarine blue amongst all of your friends. And each one of you would take like a little scoop and go, okay, I'm gonna use this for uh, the hat of the King of Spain or whatever, right? So pigments were super, super rare, but because Titian lived in the center of commerce, all of the pigments from all the world would come to his doorstep and he would have the opportunity to pick from them and put them in his paintings and so it's sort of like a ch you know this thing that spirals upwards for him is that not only is he an exceptionally talented and skilled artist but as he gets better and it, the the kind of commissions that he's able to attract he gets more money for them and he can spend that money on getting better materials better materials than almost any other artist on earth has access to and that puts him up to another level. And then you have all these other artists who are like, 
that's not fair. He's he's using colors that we don't have. Like, can you imagine in our palette that we're about to put on the like saying, okay, well, yeah, no one's allowed to use red or blue today. We're gonna do our whole paintings in yellow, yellow and a brown and a kind of very dull blue. <laughs> that's it. Like, that's that's my palette. Like, how am I gonna communicate? The, the world around me with such a limited palette. So Titian had, had you know, many, many advantages. And, and he worked for them. He, he Nothing was given to Titian, which makes him, you know, like a, a you know, a self-made man, self-made, like, superstar. He was the most in-demand artist of his time. As I said, you could he was so in demand that kings and queens from other parts in Europe who were literally at war with the city of Venice were hiring him to make paintings and those paintings you know, it's like this thing that just sort of transcends all of these global like po political conflicts. You just have him in his studio making a painting for the enemy <laughs> and everyone is just like, "Well, that's Titian, you know, he's like, if you were to think of a person, like I was trying to think today, who, what is the equivalent of Titian today? I mean, uh, like, who, who is someone that, you know, could walk into any room and would be, and, and would make a president or a king or a queen, like, oh my god goodness that's Titian just walked in the room like oh you know like what would be like Elvis Presley Michael Jackson Madonna um, Ronaldo if you want to think of soccer players you know, uh, Lionel Messi Michael Jordan like uh, Wayne Gretzky even all of those people you know, those are athletes like Steven Spielberg, like who, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, you know, like, we're talking somebody, not, like, that they were, <laughs> they are, he's on a level, like, five steps higher than any of those people. There's a famous story of Titian painting the Spanish, I think it's the Spanish, is it Philip? I, the, I think it's the Emperor of Spain. He's painting um, Philip's portrait and Titian drops his paintbrush. And you're talking like kings and queens at this point in time are considered the representatives of God on earth. Like they are essentially gods walking amongst the people, right? Titian is making this guy's portrait. He drops his paintbrush on the ground and the king bends down and picks up the paintbrush. Everyone else in the room is like, oh, like, because that's showing subservience to Titian, right? Like, it's a story that has survived five... Who knows if it's really true? It could just be apocryphal, but... The, the, the thought that, like... That that, that that was even a rumor that is survived... That came from that period of time. It was written about by um, Vasari, who, who wrote a book called The Lives of Artists which, you know, was written at that time, and I don't remember, I don't I haven't seen it being disputed, is, is like, like, what, give me an example of something else that could come close to that, right? Like, like, uh, I, I can't, <laughs> you know, I just, that is just, it's crazy. It's like, that's the level of respect that this person had. So anyway. Um, wow, lots of stuff in the chat there. People are very happy to see you here, Carla. So great. It's always great to have new people joining the, the group and painting along with us. Okay. So I think the way that I'm going to approach this painting is I'm going to first mix a really dark color and then I'm going to paint these outlines here. And it'll give us a little bit of an idea of how he may have approached this painting. And then we're going to get a little bit wild. <coughs> so you can tell I'm very excited about this. I'm also a little bit nervous, but because I, I, I want to do a good job, and I also want to do this in a way that 
that everyone watching can follow along with and not get lost. So just to add another level of difficulty to this whole enterprise. <clears throat> okay, so let's take some uh, warm red and cool blue, and I'll mix these together. And by mixing these together, these two colors are on opposite sides of the color wheel, right? So whenever I mix things across the color wheel, they cross through the neutral core. And what happens is, is they lose their saturation the closer they get to the central core here. And you get colors that look gray or brown. Um, so right now we've got this color that is not really warm or cool because we've got warm red and cool blue to make this paint, right? So it's taken all the, the coldness out of the cold blue and taking all the warmth out of the warm red and we just have this sort of neutral blah color. Now we're going to use a lot of this color throughout today's painting for uh, because there's a lot of darker shades in the painting. So even though it seems blah, one of the great things with Titian is how he he uses dark and light to create this kind of theatrical lighting known as Charles Scuru. <clears throat> which is also is a very famous, the most famous Charles, artist to use Charles Scuro is Caravaggio. Another name I love to say, Caravaggio. So let's take this dark color and I'm just going to really quickly, let's, uh, might as well just zoom in on here. That's okay. And maybe I'll just start up really fast here with this text. Now I'm going to paint over all of this. So the reason why I'm doing this is just so that I can see some of these details and then later on I'll be able to find them afterwards. In fact, I probably could have painted this white, would might have been a smarter idea, but we'll see. <laughs> I, I, I'm just thinking, I remember a, f a few episodes ago, I did this, I did one in black or a really dark color, and I did one in white so that I could observe the results so that I would know, going into this painting, what to do. And then, uh, clearly I don't remember how, th I think, I, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so let's do this face here. So I'm, it's not important to me that I get everything right. It's just that um, that I'll know where the top of the ear is, right? This is the ear here. Here's an eyebrow, another eyebrow. And I'm going to lose a little bit of this detail. Um, we'll, we'll try to, I, I won't, I'll, I'll try to make this painting in a way that, that uh, is going to make it as hopefully as straightforward as possible for even a beginner artist to follow along with. So I'll, I'm, I'll do my best because that's that's my my goal for all of these episodes. And I don't want to leave anyone behind. So, if I w the the way that he made this painting, he probably would have done a little bit of this. He would have painted. There's there's two ways that he might have gone. Up, well, no, he probably would have done this. I'm not sure which color he would have used. Sometimes artists use like a red or a blue like a very distinct color for an underdrawing like this. I don't know if he used charcoal or um, uh, or a drawing material for this or, or paint. But I suspect he, he, we know that he did some underdrawing. But underdrawing is kind of a slippery term because sometimes 
curators will and artists will use that to describe what I'm doing right now as an underdrawing, even though I'm actually using paint. People will sort of use the term drawing as just a way of describing, you know, the organization of the of the elements on the canvas. I'll get to, there's lots of comments in the chat. People are very active today, so that's great. Um, so I'll get to that as this dries here in just a few minutes. Oops. Sorry, I'm just down here. You can see I'm not being careful at all right literally not careful at all some of these marks are big and wide some of them are barely there it's just me trying to get something that I'll be able to find later on a little bit hopefully okay so let's just clean some of this excess paint off <laughs> I know it looks a little disturbing. With, it's almost like a little Mondigliani here with that one eye with without a, an iris or a pupil in there. I'll let it stay a little bit weird. So when we fix that area, it'll be more satisfying, right? Okay. So some of the some of the paint is a little bit thicker on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow dry this just to lock in that paint. I'll mute the microphone temporarily here. And then we'll begin the actual painting itself. Okay, so I see a question. There's a uh, Heidi says there's a painting in a church in Padua near Venice which has the blue that does not exist anymore. Interesting. I'm not sure which painting that is. And she also says some of the pigments in Chinese paintings and ceramics have also been exhausted. Isn't that fascinating that there are certain colors that once existed which no longer exist in their original organic or mineral form there it's i'm sure we can recreate them to some extent synthetically or digitally on a computer screen but the actual original compounds are, are gone right because like i said eventually there will be no authentic ultramarine blue anymore right think about you know when the war in afghanistan began uh, 20 years ago, almost to the day, right? Uh, think about how expensive ultramarine blue pigment all of a sudden became. Like it was weight like 10 times the price of gold, right? So if you were sitting on some ultramarine blue 20 years ago, whoo, you made some money quick, right? Uh, Rachel says, wow, <laughs> mm, lip smacking. Are oh, you going to do that painting? Oh, crazy. Uh, also, I got one question, sir. 
Do you show any of your work online or can you show us the paintings you did in the class? Um, so the paintings I did in the class, you can just go to the end of every video and you can see how those paintings turned out. Uh, and um, I guess since you're not the only person, I'll just show you really quickly in my, does it take, um, Uh, so you can see there's there's lots of articles and stuff I've been in the newspaper many times but you click on my website and <coughs> oh let me see I'm not even showing the screen um, so here is uh, this is my website this is me in a fighter plane and in the fighter plane I'll just show you really quickly uh, this is a project I did with the Royal Canadian Air Force where I was flying around. Um, I'm the first person to make art while traveling faster than the speed of sound. So here's, I made a hundred sketches in this fighter plane as part of the Royal Canadian um, War Artist Program or Canadian Forces Artist Program as it's called. And then I made giant paintings. This painting is now in a, in a private collection in a in a really big boardroom here in Vancouver and I made a bunch of these paintings that were surrounded I built this sculpture in the museum I'm not gonna go through all my work here you could find all this stuff on the web there was a documentary made about that project and myself this is the director Mike Peterson who's also who's who's quite famous now <laughs> as a director um, what's something else that might interest some people uh, let's see. This is I also as part of the War Arts program went up to the to the North Pole. Like this is me at the North Pole. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think there's a photo of and this is me making landscape paintings outside. It was minus forty, uh, making these paintings in about twenty five minutes uh, before I could no longer feel my fingers. Um, let me just see. So here's this is where I was. People when people say the North Pole, they're like, oh, it's Alaska's the North Pole. Like. Here's Toronto down here. Here's New York. There's Florida, Los Angeles. Here's where I am, Vancouver. I had to fly to Trenton, Ontario, which is the Royal Canadian Air Force headquarters. And then we flew, I think it was about uh, 12, 16 hours, some crazy number. You know, all the way up here, there's a little tiny Canadian Air Force base. The North Pole, the, the um, actual geographic North Pole is right here and the geomagnetic North Pole is right about here anyway um, what else let's show maybe one more thing here you can see there's lots of stuff on here this is a project I did I was commissioned by the Tom Thompson Art Gallery in Ontario to do uh, art celebrate well I can in honor of the 100th anniversary of Tom Thompson's death. And Tom Thompson is a very famous Canadian painter. We did a whole week of Tom Thompson art. And so, and then I also worked with a, um, a forensic sculptor to recreate the face based on this skull that was found in a supposedly empty grave. And then this was on the cover of every newspaper in Canada. Uh, this was a pretty big deal when we did this, so that was that was pretty cool. Anyway, let's uh, let's you're, you're not here to, to listen to me talk about myself because I can do that for hours. <laughs> let's make this painting. So on there, there's uh, portraits I've done. Okay, so let's look at this and think about how we're going to proceed. Because we're going to try to paint this in the manner that Titian himself used. So to do that, I want, let's zoom in. So Titian is, again, famous for painting directly onto the canvas without a colored ground. But he's still putting a kind of a ground on the painting. And as I zoom in and look at it, I can see that color here. It's coming through in certain areas of thin paint. I'm, I'm willing to bet that this reddish brown that he's got a little bit in here is what that color actually is. 
Um, and then if we zoom back out here, I don't know what color is in the background. It almost looks like a cool blue, which would make sense, right? You can see a little bit of that on these edges. So basically, and then let's see if we could see anything in here. What color is on his jacket? Like it, I like this red here. I think is pretty close to what he's using for the face as this foundational color. On the clothes, it also looks like a cool blue too, doesn't it? Wow, it's almost like I can't quite tell. And I, you can see also in the hand, there's a bit of this reddish pink color coming through. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, let's start with the background, which is where I usually like to start anyway, because I like working background to foreground. So let's take, um, let's take this cool blue. And... I'm going to use I'm going to I'm going to dilute this blue. At this point you could use water, you could use matte medium or glazing fluid to do what I'm about to do now. Um Usually, again, I put I use a warm yellow and I apply it all the way on the canvas and I mix some water into it. Uh, I think I'm gonna use. I, I haven't used. I've been wanting to use the matte medium for a while for this particular process. That's what I'm gonna use. Again, you could use water for this, Th and that's really th at this stage where we're at right now would be the only time you ever want to use water in your acrylic painting. So I'm going to take this cool blue. I've got matte medium. If you don't have matte medium, you could again, you could use water to do this. You could also use glazing medium to do this. Um, you wouldn't want to use, I don't think you'd want to use pouring medium. You could probably use Mod Podge, I think. The only thing with Mod Podge is it's it's not really made technically for for like fine art, so its archival qualities are probably a little suspect. But anyway, I'm gonna take this cool blue and let's paint this like this. Now, as I said, if despite the fact that uh, Titian was living in a time where uh, he had access to basically any color on earth that existed at the time, he probably, he, he would, he would be blown away by a color of blue that is this bright. And this, for him, would probably cost like a king's ransom, like literally, uh, to get it this bright. I'm just going to put this down because I also want to simplify the beginning stage of this painting for um, for people watching. But this would give us an idea of... of I th you know, I think he probably would have done this. It would have been maybe a little bit more brownish. Now we're going to paint over top of this. And it's going to get much darker. Obviously it's, it looks nothing like the finished painting. But... I want to, uh, it's always for me a bit of like walking a, a tight rope or fine line between teaching people how to make this painting in a fun and accessible way and then also yet, you know, uh, being somewhat true to history and the actual artist's working method. One thing I noticed really quickly off the top, actually this matte medium, which I don't usually use for putting a ground down, it's drying really quickly. So that's why I'm getting these kind of streaky kind of things going on here, which I don't really like so much. But 
it's I don't think it's gonna have a, a major overall impact on the final painting okay so we got that Oops. <laughs> just pulled the all of the paintbrushes I'm using are also the you know basically some of the cheapest paintbrushes you can buy right I've since the beginning my my ethos for all these classes is paint that is the highest quality but also the cheapest you can get the paint brushes these are all from a set I think two sets of paint brushes that I bought from Michael's art supply I think each one was like 12 bucks so you can make any of the paintings we're making with inexpensive brushes inexpensive paint inexpensive canvas these are uh, I actually ordered these off of Amazon they're 9 by 12 sized canvases but you can get them at usually your dollar store I do find the spending two dollars on them from you know the amazon ones you, they're probably they're more usually often a little more expensive at your art supply store probably like four or five dollars each but they, the quality is superior especially if you're putting a lot of pigment or not pigment like water or mediums on there it can the cheap ones are just cardboard and they actually will bend and warp a little bit <laughs> <laughs> okay so now let's um you know what I'm gonna apply a warm red over this whole thing and which is again a little bit different than what he did but it's gonna give us a nice contrast between this cold blue which is gonna want to go backwards and the warm red which is want to go forwards so I know some people who've been painting with me for a year are like, what is he doing? He's doing everything different than what he normally does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's it's not because I'm still a little bit sick. I, I well, I don't. I'd like to think not, but maybe I am in a delirious, <laughs> hallucinatory state right now. Um, maybe I've always been right. Uh, so I'm going to take this warm... You know what? That's This is going to be outrageous for the face. That's just going to be a little little much. You know what? So actually, I'm going to take a bunch of this yellow. Give it a bit more orange. So this is warm red and warm yellow. And if you want to buy this, the exact same paints that I'm using in the description below, you can see links to, to buy them. There, I also made a whole video showing if you don't have access to that brand or you don't, you already have some paints by a different company. I show you exactly the the paints from like about a dozen other paint companies that you can use to paint along with me, right? So I'm going to take this, and I'm just going to quickly paint over this whole face just like this so what is the difference between doing my normal process of painting yellow first and then painting other colors over top of it and what I'm doing right now well the the main difference is is that there's just one less color right normally up there's yellow over everything and that is a nice kind of warm yellow that gives everything this sort of Kodachrome kind of glow warm glow and then subsequently I paint other colors over top of it so, so that yellow is not really inherently visible in the final product. I mean, it's, it's, you can see it, but your brain doesn't really know that you're seeing it. So what we've done here is it's like we're taking an ingredient out of the stock of our soup, right? So if you imagine uh, making a soup and, and we've been, let's, let's imagine <laughs> this has been a cooking class for the past hundred 
18 episodes and we usually begin with a vegetable stock and that that's the yellow right it's just imagine we're making a soup today without the stock right so we can still make a delicious soup it's just that we've taken a, a, a major ingredient out and depending on how you see it it's uh it might allow for the other flavors <laughs> to to shine maybe a little bit more than they otherwise would be, right? Which is exactly what Titian's uh, trying to do here. He's trying to... He wants the color to be as saturated as possible. So he wants big, bright colors. And that's what we're going to be doing here. That's what is, he's very famous for. And ultimately what the Venetian school is famous for. So much so that if you've ever been to Venice and you see the paintings by uh, by Titian, Giorgione, or Tintoretto, who are all, you know, uh, also very famous Venetian artists, the colors are, are so bright that when not done by a, a, a master like Titian, almost seems a little bit garish and it's it's you can see why the, and this whole process starts to kind of take over a little bit we move into the baroque period after the renaissance and the baroque period is is um is is almost the overuse of really bright clashing colors and patterns you know it's it's like uh it's it, which is the opposite of the Renaissance, of this very structured, subdued kind of approach to painting. Um, let's see, in the chat there, Donna says, Hi all, I just popped in to say hi. I went to a fib last night and spent... I went into a fib last night and spent the night in the hospital. They had to shock me back for the second time in two months. Oh my goodness. Uh, Paul, it's the story that you went to the hospital last night. I'm wishing you'd get better, Donna. And Lori says, glad they got you back in sync, Donna. Sorry to go through that. Get well back. My goodness, Donna. They they shocked you back to life. That is a miracle that you're here with us today. Thank you. Cheers to you, Donna. Oh my goodness. That is, that's intense. Whew. No. Knock on some wood. I mean, it goes to show how precious life is, and uh, which is why, like, I've you know, when I'm making paintings, I'm feeling like if I was to drop dead right now, or at any time over the past year while I've been doing this project, painting along with you, I would feel like, okay, yeah, you know, it's a bummer that I died, but thank goodness. I was able to to do something that I feel is like constructive and uh, po a very positive use of my time, as opposed to, well, I won't get into the other things I think are wastes of time, but because um, we might have very dis very big disagreement over what that'll be. Okay, <laughs> looks like this is almost done. Now, again, I know that there's there's there'll eventually be some curator or conservator expert on the art of Titian who will look at this and go, are you kidding me? This idiot is teaching people how to, to paint a Titian and this is like, this is not a stage that you would ever see in, in Titian's studio. I know, I know, but I'm trying, I want to, I'm trying to balance between uh, trying to make this painting in a, in in just a ba bare semblance to his approach, as well as an introductory painting class, right? I, I at the same time I would say I don't think we're super far off, right? These colors are definitely way more saturated than he would have used, but I suspect we're kind of in the zone here, um, especially with this particular painting, right? It's a, it's, it's, this painting is is probably his most simple painting, which is why I chose it for our class. There's certainly, 
most of his other paintings are incredibly complicated with dozens, if not like, you know, 50, 60 figures, humans in the paintings, climbing on top of one another, and landscapes in the background. Like here, we basically just have one person who's wearing this big dark jacket and they're against a flat dark background. Like, compared to everything else he's done, this is this is about as simple as it gets, right? So, I, again, I think this is we're pretty close. Okay, so what should we do next? I think let's start working on the face. I think that's what makes the most sense to me is we're going to mix some colors for the face. I also want to try to paint it like Titian. Titian is, is famous, especially as he gets older, for much more of an expressive painterly, and that's a real word, art word, painterly approach to painting, uh, which becomes is arguably his most longest lasting legacy, which essentially prefigures Impressionism by 300 years. And by painterly, it's this idea of making brushstrokes that are still visible, right? Unlike Leonardo, who went to great pains to make super transparent layers of paint, and we cannot see a single brushstroke. It looks like it was not even touched by a human being, that it's been just appeared like an apparition from the heavens, right? And this painting is not the best example of Titian's work, uh, more painterly work, but we're still trying to approach it a little bit like that. So let's zoom in and actually maybe even before I, I zoom completely in here let's uh, let's mix a skin tone <clears throat> so actually I can still use this there is a bit of there's a lot of matte medium in there I'm gonna use it anyway I'm gonna use that matte medium let's take a little bit of warm blue. I'll just put it off to the side here. Mix this in. We get a bit of a brown, right? Um, just a little bit darker. There we go. And then I'm going to take some white. Okay, let's mix all this up. We'll just use it because we're going to use all this paint. Now, that color's not bad. I don't know how well it comes across on camera. It's it's a little bit more on the bluish side of things, which gives it a bit of. If I was to paint, you know, it's not too different than my own skin tone, but it is a little bit. Um, kind of a bit of a deadish kind of color. So I'm gonna put a little bit more red in here to warm it up a bit. And give it, you can see, it looks a lot more like, uh, almost like a blush, a human blush. That might be, I might have gone a little too far. So let's put a bit of yellow in here. And then I think I've gone a little bit too far in that direction. So let's put a bit more blue in here. Remember, we're just using warm red, warm yellow, and warm blue with some white. And then I went a little bit too far in the blue. Right? So it's a little... A little. Let's take, put some more white back in here. It's managing these um, ratios of color that, that you get to the color you want. And even if you don't get exactly what you want, it's not a, a major problem because we're going to be doing a few different little layers in here. Okay, so I'm going to put use that. I'm also going to add a bit of glazing fluid to this. So this is satin glazing fluid or matte glazing fluid. I do have gloss glazing fluid, which we used just the other day. I tend to prefer matte everything I tend to just like I don't really like glossy paint um, I was I just never liked that look with acrylic paint but I think I'm in the mi minority I think most painters really like glossy paint glossy paint tends to 
show colors more brightly and contrast between light and dark more than matte does. But it's, you know, again, it's up to the individual to, and as you might not even have a preference yet, but as you paint for, I've been at this for 20 years, you start to kind of get, you just, there's just things that you tend to gravitate towards, right? So let's get these two views side by side. Right, you're like, whoa, that color seems really off, Michael. But let's take this color we just mixed. It's got lots of glazing fluid in it, so it's going to be kind of thin, maybe even too thin as I'm painting this now. So not bad. We'll, we'll build up a few layers of it anyway. So, um,. Basically, painting most of this color over most of this face up here, I think. Right over top of my lines. So the point is, is we're, we have, still have that red underneath that is going to keep on coming through layer after layer, infusing this painting with color. So I'm going to put this here, and you know, I'm also going to paint over, I'm going to imagine his face is under here, right? Because all of this, uh, his face is literally underneath this beard. So, especially because some of that hair on his mustache and things is a little bit thin, I want a little bit of this color to be kind of seeping through here. Gives us also a little bit of an idea what this guy would have looked like without his beard, right? Similarly, I'm going to do a little bit of that just right up in the crown of his hair here. So if I want to paint that a little bit thin, I'll have a little bit of this color underneath there. Don't forget the ear. And there we go. I mean, obviously, super, super subtle thing we just did here, right? And that's going to be a little bit of the, the name of today's game. Just like when we painted the Mona Lisa and the girl with the pearl earring. It's, we're going to take our time building up some layers of color. <laughs> But that's a good kind of first step. We can also do the same thing with the hand down here. All right, this. So we're at the edge of this painting down there, you can see. Okay. So very simple. Start there. Now let's uh, let's back it out again and see what's next. I think let's do the hair next. So now let's move the painting out of the way, and let's we're gonna take we're gonna mix a brown. Maybe I'll back it out right here. We're gonna be continuing to dip into this skin tone throughout the episode, so I'll just leave it on its side. I'm gonna mix a new color adjacent to it. Okay. Yeah, I'll just wash this off. I don't really want too much white on here. That's you, You've probably seen, often there's times where I barely wash my paintbrush throughout an entire episode. Especially towards the end of a painting. Usually at the end of the painting, I love it when my paintbrush starts to just get a little bit muddy with color. Because then I'm painting colors that are really hard to mix. And even a, an experienced painter is looking at it like, 
how did he get that color? <laughs> and to be honest, sometimes I, when I'm looking at my own painting, I'm like, I have no idea what color that is. Because that's, that's just like every color in there, in various different proportions. So, but I kind of like that. I like that, uh, um, uh, it's that mystery, which we've talked about before. So here's some warm yellow and warm red. Just making another orange, kind of like what we had before. In fact, let's just scoop some of that up here so you can see that I'm using that same color from before. Warm red, warm yellow. The only difference is there's no white in here so far. And let's put some blue. Ooh, that was too much. So I put too much blue. So now we have like a really, really dark brown. It's almost like a really dark green because we've got so much of that ultramarine blue, the warm blue. Let's put a bit more warm red. So we're just going to have to just up the ratios of the other colors in here. And usually yellow, because it's the least bright of all those colors, is the one that you usually have to add more and more of because it disappears most quickly. Oops. So again, this is good, but I want it to be a little bit more of a reddish brown. So I, if anything, I want a little more red and blue. Okay, I like that. I could go darker, but part of this process is, is kind of adding some layers. So I'm just going to take my glazing fluid. Now I suspect I'm gonna this is where I'm gonna kind of leap probably a couple of weeks over top of where he would be. Because I imagine what he would have done, he would have mixed a color virtually identical to this, and then gone into this painting and almost painted every bit of hair, like little, little, in fact, we can, if we zoom in on this, we don't see every little bit of hair, and the, the image isn't the highest resolution, but you can kind of see, especially where it meets the skin, we see little more individual pieces of hair, like in the beard, you see how there's these, so I imagine what he's done is that he's painting many thin layers, oops, like he's, that there's probably 10 layers of very thin paint painting hundreds of little hairs here, right? And that's, that would make this painting absolutely outstanding to see in real life. If you could stand in front of it for an hour, you would see more and more hair as your eyes adjusted. I am obviously not going to do that just for the sake of time so that I don't have another six hour long episode. Um, come on, let's go. Okay. So I'm just gonna take a fairly large brush and just paint this in here and again the change is very subtle the goal for me is not to you know I could paint this painting a version of it in in an hour like you've seen me do do that sometimes at the end of an episode where I do it a second painting by the same artist in an hour. I could do this painting really, really fast, just like that. I could mix all of the the colors, and we could do a race, a, a speed version of this painting. But I kind of, I, I really want to show a little bit of how this great artist his a little bit of his, just a small window into the process, right? Okay. 
Okay. You know, in re retrospect, some of these dark lines on the hairline... Well, there's going to be a bit of work to cover that up. That wasn't really, you know, that's one of the... But you can see already we're, we have we've painted these two layers this this kind of brown over top of the beard and we've got this bit of a halo of his chin underneath there that's great I like that kind of stuff <laughs> um let's zoom back out and as I'm looking at it from further away you know what I'm gonna just take this brown. And I'm just going to paint it directly onto his jacket and everything else as well. That's just going to speed up a little bit of the process for his clothes. Now we're going to add another color later on that's going to totally modify all of this. But this color under here will also just give it that extra little bit of complexity that we were looking for in our great paintings. Need a bit more glazing fluid. All right, so the change between those two colors is very subtle. Between the original and what we're painting over top of it. And we're just going to leave this little bit as it is and ideally it'll stay like that throughout the entire painting and we won't even touch it again. That little bit of his undershirt or collar or whatever that is. I don't know if he's wearing a t-shirt underneath there. Maybe he was the, the inventor of the t-shirt. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me, you know, being kind of a this hipster. <laughs> okay. Again, so pretty subtle transition so far. Now, let's... Um, where should we go to next? Part of me starts thinking we should do a little bit... Uh, you know what, I'm going to take this brown and let's just do the book here as well. <laughs> okay, I think what we want to do next is let's do something similar but on the background. So... Let's take, let's, why don't we mix a warm brown so that we can, or sorry, a cool brown, my apologies. Where, where am I? There we are. Because <laughs> um, we just mixed a cool, or sorry, we're going to make a cool brown. We just made a warm brown for the clothes and the face. Let's do the, the opposite, a cool color will go in the background. So we'll take our cool yellow, that should be enough, and let's take some of this cool blue and mix it together, and we get this lovely, beautiful, almost fluorescent green. I love this color. It's one of my favorite colors that we can get with this split primary uh, palette here. And then some warm red. We'll put that in here. We'll mix it together. And look at the difference, right? So this is now a very cool brown. But, you know, we'll, we'll brighten it up with a bit more yellow. And maybe we'll take more of this red in here. It's still very blue. So here's, this is a warm or cool brown. I keep saying getting those mixed up. 
So here's our cool brown, very different than the warm brown, right? Let's put a bit more yellow in here. It just looks a little bit too dour. And as we do that, we're gonna need more, you know, it's this, these ratios. Okay. Now, he's putting a fairly thin layer of this on there, I, I imagine in this background, he's probably got about at least three or four layers of color here. I think just for the sake of moving this whole painting along, rather than diluting this with some glazing fluid, I'm just gonna paint this directly onto the surface and we'll see what the results we get. Just because I don't wanna, I, don't, I just don't wanna spend the majority of today's episode painting a background. <laughs> There's already enough stuff going on elsewhere in this painting. So let's just take a look here. Let's see, I've covered up a bit of that text. So we'll bring that back shortly. You can see all of those kind of blue streaky marks. Again, that's because the paint is still relatively thin. There is, I did use a generous helping of that cool blue that had matte medium in it. So I'll just try to kind of brush those streaks out. Right, and you got to be careful because now I'm starting to kind of actually remove paint as I'm painting, which is kind of frustrating. So I'm like literally scrubbing paint off as I'm trying to apply more paint. So I'll just leave it like that. So we're getting closer to the actual color that we see in his painting. This looks right now a little bit kind of an ugly barfy kind of color so we'll modify it again with I think at least one more layer there to finish that off yeah there's no point in doing too much tinkering here because we'll keep getting yeah I gotta follow my own advice one of these days don't you think okay <laughs> Deborah says, oh, Donna, I'm glad they got you back. I'll be thinking about you and sending you positive thoughts and prayers. Donna says, thank you. Joshua says, yeah, I know. It's Markowski's special day when he does not use yellow underpaint. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Deborah says, rye observant Josh, or very observant Josh. And Heidi says, the painting with the blue mentioned above is the decoration of the Scorvengi uh, Chapel in Padua by Giorgio de Bondone around 1305. Interesting. 
I'll have to look at that up. I was not aware of that. That's super cool. I love it when people tell me stuff that I don't know, right? It's super exciting to learn, which is why I'm sure most of you are watching right now. Okay. So I'm I'm thinking we're getting I I would be I would be willing to bet money that that we're now pretty close to what Titian would have seen at some point in his painting process. Again, these colors, especially on here, is maybe a little bit brighter, and I think he was probably doing, which we're going to do here in a second, a little bit more of that painterly stuff in this thing here. Um, okay. So, in fact, let's do that. Let's just dry. I'm going to blow dry that. Everything's a little bit tacky. Because whenever you put medium into your paint, it often um, lengthens the drying time. Things get a little tacky. So I'm going to mute the microphone. Okay, actually, I, I decided I'm going to save this jacket for a second. Let's go do a little bit more work on the face. Because I think that's, you know, probably where most people are most interested in learning today anyway. But Okay. So what I'm going to do is we've got this kind of skin tone that I mixed earlier, right? And that was, again, warm red, warm yellow, and warm blue, and white. I'm going to take blue, this warm blue, and we're going to get a little bit of a more bluish color here. I'm going to add a good heaping of glazing fluid. I'm gonna instead of doing that, I'm gonna t do a little something a little different. Okay, I'm gonna take this glazing fluid. My brush is still a little bit dirty. In fact, let's take a bit of this skin tone. Take a bit of cool blue and mix it into here. So I want to get a bit of this cold bluish color as a glaze on this face. <clears throat> so does that stay here? Let's move this up. So now I want to look for some of the colder areas in the face. Probably the first places we can. S let's get a smaller brush. in and around the eyes here. Okay. 
in his cheeks and the forehead. In fact, this could have even been a little bit. I'm going to add a bit more cool blue into this. Put a bit of that into some of the hair. I'm just rubbing a bit off. Let's put a little bit more back on there. Oh, that's a little much. I think I gotta let this dry, blow dry it. Yeah, oops, okay, yeah. That's driving me crazy. See, I get always so impatient. <laughs> a little bit heavy-handed with this cold blue but I think it's especially just our time constraint here I think it'll be it's fine it'll also kind of show later on here how this is integrated into the piece because we're gonna glaze some warmer colors flush tones over that and we want some of that those cool colors in the face, because we have cool colors in our face. The face isn't all just one big bright, um, warm uh, surface, right? There's lots of different things going on, especially underneath the skin. And then while I'm right here, let's do the same thing with that, with the hand here. shadow that's on his hand here okay and then you know what while we're here I think let's uh, let's zoom out and just do a bit of this I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a warm blue to do this I'm just gonna use this glazing medium here and get this kind of darker color Maybe I'll stay in a bit there. Let's do his jacket. And you know, I'm gonna brighten this up just so people can see some of the texture 
in here. So obviously that's not how the original painting is, but it gives us a little bit of an idea of some of the darker areas in this painting. So I want to look for kind of the, the dark parts of these folds. shadows with this this is mostly just a warm blue ultramarine blue kind of mixed in with some browns that I had there it's kind of a pretty kind of a dirtier color but this is great for just sort of laying in some shadows right a lot of this area underneath this arm is just shadow most of the light is hitting from above I bet you I'm not too far off at all from the way that he would have the, the kind of speed that he's painting that's one of the reasons why you know he's a kind of uh, unusual for his period of time is that this type of painting reminds me a lot of like Edouard Manet and some of the first impressionists just these just this very vigorous approach to painting Right? It's obviously subdued in the shadows in this particular painting, but if we were to spend a little more time looking at the other paintings he did, you'd see a lot more of this type of thing. Okay. So, I'm going to reset that. Boom, look how much darker that painting gets. And that's pretty typical. Like, most Renaissance paintings um, are kind of dark. They're dark mostly anyways, but they got more, they got really dark as they got more and more varnish over them and the varnish over the centuries yellowed and deteriorated. Um, so a lot of paintings that haven't been cleaned are, are like sometimes barely visible. Some of the details that are in there. You might see part of the face is visible. Everything else is really, really dark and yellow. So this, now, you can see this face, he looks kind of ghostly and sickly and pale, right? Like a zombie. And it's, it's worth really thinking about that, is that this is how we build up the 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 internal structure underneath the skin is we give it this kind of um, lifeless quality and then we're, we're putting the warm skin over top of those cooler colors right because we have you know your, your blood we've got really bright red warm blood fresh from our lungs pumping through our body and then we've got this cool blood that's pumping back to our heart right and as that's going around so we have warm and cool colors underneath our skin so we want to capture that in this painting with this ghoulish quality at this stage right so this is the kind of thing if you were painting a king or queen 
and they're sitting there doing your portrait, you want to do this quickly and then move to the next stage as quickly as possible or put a <laughs> curtain over because you don't want them looking at, they're like, oh, you, this is what I'm going to look like when I'm dead. This is like some sort of witchcraft. <laughs> you're like, just, just uh, you don't want to see the painting right now. I don't think you're going to be very happy. <laughs> but but I, I'm willing to bet money that at some point the portrait would have looked a little bit like this, right? In fact, if anything, a little bit more of cool blue. To the point where let's put a little more cool blue on here. Why not? Let's uh, let's just keep on going. Because I like that this look, and I see a bit of it in that painting too. So let's gonna put a bit more cool blue on my paintbrush. Let's dive in. I hope I'm not gonna go over the edge here, but. Might as well just take this color and put it in the beard. Oh, doesn't he look... He looks like an unhappy zombie. <laughs> ah! Oh, I hate it when I do this, when I get a little bit too... I just should just let that dry. I'm going to blow dry that and, and fix that. So. Okay, that's the thing with glaze, you know, like if you, if you uh, paint an area and then you kind of walk away and you paint a little bit more, you, you end up actually scrubbing some of that paint right back off, so, which is what I just did, which is very frustrating. Um, let's just quickly do this hand... <clears throat> okay, I want to pick up the pace here a lot. So, I think I'll probably... Okay, now I'm going to... Should we... Let's do the hair. Okay, so, ideally, you know, what Titian would have done is he would have done what we're doing now, and he would have spent probably a month or so doing it. Like, literally, every day, putting a couple of glazes those glazes could take two or three days to dry so he would probably have two or three paintings going on simultaneously we know he had he did two versions of this painting and it's said that they were painted side by side so he, he probably did this painting probably almost to this to this um stage and then started the other one so that and then built it up to this point because I think he was he was definitely figuring out where everything needed to be. And he was like, okay, I think I'm, I know where this is headed. Let's start the other one. We'll just copy what I got here and then build it up to that stage. So that, that way, he's got lots of paintings going simultaneously. So if one is drying, that's okay. He's just going to be painting on another one. Or, you know, while this area is drying, you know, this is what he does on Monday. And then here he's working on Tuesday. Wednesday he's working on this. And then maybe by Friday the face is dry enough that he could put another glaze on, right? So these, and then again, he's doing that on all these other paintings side by side, often having mixed the same color. Remember, this is a, this is like 
300 years before tubes of paint. So if you mix a color of paint, what are you going to do with it? Right? You gotta, you gotta use it. Otherwise, it's gonna harden and dry up. And imagine it's using one of these pigments that costs, you know, thousands of dollars for just a couple of ounces of it. You're gonna want to find a use for it, right? And you don't want to just put it in the background where it's not visible. You want to put it on somewhere important, right? Okay. So, how can I speed? What should I do to speed up here? Let's do. Let's do the book. Let's get some white on here. So I'm going to take some white with some warm yellow. And I'm just going to I'm going to apply this directly to the pages of the book here. in a fairly opaque manner again at this point now I'm just saying okay I think you kinda get the, the the process let's now pick up the speed dramatically and just uh, finish the painting <laughs> otherwise this w would be like an eight or nine hour session and <clears throat> I'm not feeling the greatest and you know I can hear you know our, our daughter's bedtime is in a couple of hours so I want to be able to be there for that Maybe while I'm here, let's do put a little bit of white. I'm gonna take a bit of this. Should I should take a bit of the skin tone. Much more white. I'm gonna put this in the white of the eyes. So let's zoom in. Now, I'm not exactly sure where the shape of these eyes are going to be just yet. So I'm just going to paint it kind of like that. Actually, you know what? Let's just go full on. <laughs> full zombie. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Okay. That will give us something fun to look at for a while. <laughs> The zombie Danielle Barbaro. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, let's do. Let's do the. Let's do another pass on the jacket. So this jacket is, it's got a, it's got that cool blue and, it's, it's kind of an, see, see, this is the thing, when we're talking about uh, artists who use glazes, like these classical artists, trying to identify what one color they used is impossible, right? I'm looking at, at this image and I just see, I see warm blues, I see cool blues, I see browns and reds. Of some greens oops so obviously what that is is many many layers of glaze so what we're talking about doing is like trying to take maybe five or six layers of glaze condense it down into just a few for our you know immediate purpose let's do a Um, what's the fastest way we could do this? Let's do a, a warm brownish blue. Which actually we'll probably use again for his beard. It's, sim it's similar to this, right? So we took, we had this warm yellow. Let's take a bit more of it. Warm red. Let's make, let's make this, basically we'll use this for the, the hair as well. Just a different level of, of, of blue. In fact, let's put this... Maybe we'll do the hair right now. Because then we'll just darken it for the jacket. Okay. 
Okay, so we got this dark, um, warm brown. I'm just going to take this and just put it right into his hair. I'm going to forego even putting glazing fluid in it. I am going to darken it even more. as we go here, but, uh, let's zoom in. So again, this is like us leapfrogging in time by about a month. We're losing significantly, uh, the subtlety in this beard, but that's just the way it's going to have to be. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess, what do, I mean, there's, I don't really have a choice, right? That's, I'm not, I wish I was, but, you know. Okay, so let's take this same color we're just gonna darken it with a little bit more blue so let's take some more warm blue mix it into here and now we've got like a really really dark brown almost like a more it's like basically like a very bluish brown or like a blue with brown in it and then I'm going to do the same thing. We're, I'm just going to put this. Oh, I wish I. Uh, yeah. I'm just. Like, doing this is basically covering up some of the work that I, I spent doing these kind of glazes down here. Maybe I'll thin it out a little bit. I'm, I'll get the darkest areas first. And then, yeah, we'll, I'll dilute it a little bit with a bit of glazing fluid. But we'll get this, yeah, let's do this. Didn't even notice how dark this collar up here was. Okay, so I'm going to take this color, let's put a bit of glazing fluid in here, take some more blue. Just mix this up, and this will just dilute it just a little bit, so it won't be quite as dark as the color we just applied. All right, and I can basically just just go over top of everything. The only thing I want to think about is trying to keep some of the the shape of this jacket. So that I don't want to just paint right across or straight up and down. I still want the it to feel like it's draping over his shoulders like this. Right, we can paint right over top of the dark areas, and they will stay there. Uh, 
Let's even take this color and put this on the book. You know, another kind of interesting thing about this painting is the kind of story behind it itself is kind of fascinating. Is that this painting, you know, again, Titian is at this point in his career, we're talking 14, 1545, he lives for another 30 years, I think, and he dies in his late 80s. So he's about 50 years old when he makes this painting. He is, at this point, acknowledged as the greatest living artist, right? Uh, Leonardo has passed away by now, I'm pretty sure. I think Leonardo dies about 1530, I think. So, Titian is the indisputable master, right? No, there's there's no one questioning it. There's, there's certainly people who are rivaling him, younger painters. Uh, even Giorgione, who he collaborated with. Uh, on some of his early paintings. Giorgione dies of the plague at around age 33 or something around there. So, um, and Venice, again, Venice being a center of commerce, there's like, I think, four or five major plagues that ravage Venice, like 1504, 1506, 1510, 1514, like plagues that just, you know, kill. 40% of the town, right? And that happens again. A few years later, it happens again. Five years later, it happens again, right? And it, and it, not only it gets killing all sorts of people, including some of the great artists of the time, Giorgione being the most famous of them, right? So his best friend and frequent collaborator, collaborator and really his only major rival, a guy who paints in a very similar style to him, dies at that, you know, I think in 1510... Or, yeah, around 1514, something like that. So, now you've got the Undisputed Master. What happens at this point is uh, you have people that are, are art collectors. And there's a, a, a wealthy patron who collects portraits of famous people. And... You know, it's like somebody who collects photos of Marilyn Monroe and John Lennon and Elvis Presley, right? Again, photography doesn't exist yet. So there's somebody who wants... He, he's a fan of this Daniel Barbaro who is a, a humanist. He's a, a, an author, a researcher, a kind of a prominent man about town. So he commissions... He says to the, he says to the Daniel Barbaro, says... Hey, I've got this collection of famous people. I would love, I'd be honored if I could have your portrait join my collection. Who would you who would you want to, to paint your portrait? And Barbaro says, Well, I mean, you know, it's kind of like asking somebody who would you get to play you in a movie. Well, I mean, I don't I know it's kind of asking a lot, but you know, if you're asking me who I want to paint my portrait, well. I gotta say, I'd love to have Titian do it, you know, like, would, what do you think about that? And the collector is like, whoo, you, uh, you really want, to, uh, you're really going for the, you know, the, you're shooting for the stars here, right? Okay, so they approach Titian, and Titian, not one to turn a commission down, is like, sure, I'll make that painting. So Titian makes the portrait of Daniel Barbaro. Again, he makes two copies, one of which... He sells to, and I can't remember the name of that patron, and then one of which he keeps for himself. Now, I'm not sure which one, whether it's this version, the one that's in the National Gallery of Canada, or the one that's in the Prado Museum in Spain, that is given to the patron, and which one uh, the artist, keep, Titian, keeps for himself. Often, artists will keep the best version for themselves, with the idea of, like, hey... If I can make a copy of this painting and I can sell that one, and that person's more than happy to buy that painting, if I keep one for myself that is actually even better, well, should I fall on hard times? And he's seen, again, his best friend die of the plague. You know, you think to yourself, well, this is sort of my insurance, right? I keep a, the, a really good painting that I know is already sold, an inferior copy, 
has already sold for a good sum of money. I'll keep the, a better version for myself in my closet. Should anything happen to me, maybe I get hit by a uh, horse-drawn carriage or I break a leg and I, or some kind of thing happens, I'm not able to paint for a period of time or maybe ever again, I start pulling out some of these oldie but goodies out of the closet and that can save me and my family from like literal destitution, right? So that's something artists have been doing for a long time. Okay, Zom zombie Titian, uh, let's, uh, where should we go next? The painting is slowly getting darker and darker and darker, and yet we have some of these, um, we still see some of the details going on here. I think what we need to do is we need to tackle the face, get some life back into this face, put some eyes back into those blank sockets. So let's, um, let's do just that. Let's mix the skin tone. It's probably starting to dry up a bit. So, yeah, let's take some warm yellow. Let's just, we're going to mix more of it right into here. Warm yellow, warm red. Make an orange and take a bit more yellow. Some blue. There's a little bit too much blue in there, so... Oh, not bad. Actually, now that I mix it a little bit more thoroughly, that's not bad. Let's put some white in here. Not bad. I think we're just for the sake of time. So he he would have done maybe two or three layers of this color, and then he's going to go back and add two or three layers of the color I'm about to use. So I'm just going to again I'm going to skip a couple layers of paint and just go for a little bit lighter. Because we've got to get to this, right? And I want to do get here within ideally the next 45 minutes or so. So <clears throat> let's put some glazing fluid right here. Mix my brush right into this mixture. So I think I need more white. Just I'm gonna add more since I add a lot more white, that's gonna make that this is titanium white, which is the most uh, like it it's the most opaque of all the paints. So I don't want to go too wild, otherwise I'm just going to cover everything up. So let's see, I think this is okay. We won't really know until I start painting it, right? Okay, so we'll go over top, even over top of these blues. And you see how now we've got th this beautiful layering effect. These colors kind of coming through that cold color. Now we're, we're bringing some life back onto it. It's like we just applied a layer of skin back onto this dead corpse. Right, you're going to start to wake him back up again. That's great. Okay, let's do the same thing on this hand here real quick. So I'm not going to paint over all of it. That's good. Okay. So let's. I'm going to blow dry this. We're going to do that all over another time. Second time.
In fact, here, I'm going to set a timer for myself. I want to be done in 45 minutes. Oops, not an hour, 45. <laughs> let's, 45 minutes, let's try to knock this out in that period of time. Asking a little much for one of the greatest paintings and <laughs> probably the greatest painting in all of Canada. Um, and one of the greatest, by one of the greatest artists of all time, but I'm just going to keep on going here. So let's take a little bit more of the same color. Focusing more and more on the highlights. I'm going to use the hair dryer again and we're just going to do this again. Okay, so I'm gonna now mix more white here. Let's just, I'm just gonna keep leapfrogging ahead steps. Let's put a bunch more white in. Oops. So I added just a bunch more white. Here's some glazing fluid. And I'm gonna clean this brush off because there's a lot of pigment on there. how I'm also going to use my uh, a blending brush to kind of move some of this color around Just soften up my brush strokes. Now you got to be careful with adding too much white in here, otherwise this face is going to start looking a little bit sickly, right? We don't want that, obviously. Um, so let's get... I'm going to take a bit of warm red and just mix that into this color. 
get a bit of pink back in here and I'm gonna blow dry this as well really quick Looks like I need even a bit of warm yellow on here. Getting this ear over here. All right, so life is coming back into this poor dead man. <laughs> and okay, I think at this point I'm going to use. Let's mix a dark color. I'm going to start putting in like the eyebrows and the lines on the face again. So I'm going to use this. I guess I can still use this. It's still got a bit of punch left in it. So here's some warm. Let's mix basically another uh, warm brown again. And I'm not really concerned about getting the exact likeness down here, uh, especially now that I'm in a bit of a rush. Um, start small and make these eyes bigger as, as I go. And you would probably, you'd, you'd, if you were really do, trying to do this, you'd do these as like very thin glazes, not just these big dark brown 
brush strokes like I'm applying here right now, right? This is the the fast way of getting things done. Let's get the ear. So I, I'm, I might, I'm sure I'm going maybe a little bit fast for some people out there. You can always just pause and, and or and or just watch for a minute and then go and work on yours and do a little bit. You know, or, or take a break. You don't have to get it all done in one session. Debating my oops, that's a little too much. To myself, if I want to add actual red onto the lips, or just leave this as is, I'm not quite sure. Trying to get some of the the hair up top there. Quite the strong um, uh, cheekbones here, hey? in the chat there Heidi says uh, I've got to go for now happy painting everyone have a nice weekend thank you Michael take care and good night Heidi thanks for joining us Paul says good night Heidi and hi Michael when you use the brush to blend is the brush wet or dry uh, this brush this blending brush or what's called a mop brush you know like when you mop a floor of a kitchen or bathroom uh, this mop brush is wet you want it to be as or sorry this brush is dry. You want it to be as dry as possible when you're using it. That's why you may even want to have two or three of these so that, because as it, as you use it, it starts to get a little bit, you know, there's, you're, you're wiping paint around and it starts to get a little crusty and you've got to put it in water and then you want to take it out. And you've probably seen me trying to dry it vigorously off as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to complicate that with another color shortly. I've got 30 minutes here, folks, so let's, uh, no rest for the wicked. <laughs> I 
I think next I will, let's just take a look. I think I'm gonna work on the background next. We'll finish the background, we'll put the text up in the uh, top part of the painting. Um, so, what does that look like? <laughs> I feel like it looks like somebody, like an actor. What's his name? Oh, it's going to drive me crazy now. Doesn't it look like, uh, oh, he was in Indiana Jones and Transformers. Somebody will rem remember. What's his name? Indiana Jones, Transformer. I keep thinking of Joaquin Phoenix, but it's not Joaquin Phoenix. It's... <laughs> okay, I've got to I've got to do a quick little... What's his name? There we are. <laughs> Does it not look a little bit like Shia LaBeouf here? You kidding me? <laughs> I've made a, a portrait. I'm making a portrait of Shia LaBeouf. Right, like. <laughs> oh my goodness. <clears throat> okay. Let's keep on going. Um. So this background, I'm not super happy with this color yet. So we need to, I mean, I need to be darker and it needs to be a little bit more of a pleasant color. So right now we've got blue and we've got brown over top of it, kind of streaky. So let's, uh, I'm gonna take more cool blue. I'm gonna mix it with some, I'm gonna take a bit of warm red. Which is gonna give it a bit of a brownish quality. A little bit purpley. Purple's too much, hey? So let's take a bit of warm red as well. Cut that purple down. some glazing fluid in <clears throat> so it's not quite as dominant or intense but I think this background is going to go purpley which is not the but it's too too purpley that is too purple let's get some more warm blue in here more warm red and which is going to make it kind of more of a dark color less purple that <clears throat> Whoa. 
How did I get, where did this come from? <sighs> Too purpley. So let's put some cold yellow in here. Oh, that's a lot of cold yellow. Let's move that to the side. I like this color, it's gonna to be too dominant, so put some glazing fluid next to it. Maybe I'll take that. We don't wanna to totally radically paint over everything. We just wanna modify this color, right? I think that's good. We've got a, kind of a bit of a grayish thing going on here. That's not bad. Much better. Not maybe as transparent as I would have liked. Would have liked to have seen a little bit more of those textures in behind, but I've got 23 minutes left on the clock. Okay, I think it's as it dries, it's going to be okay. Okay, so let's do the jacket. It's going to be something kind of similar, but rather than this kind of darker color, we're going to go, or rather than this cool color, we're going to go darker. So we're going to go dark blue. We'll basically make a, a dark brown. So this is warm yellow, warm red, and warm blue. <laughs> and if anything, I want it to go even more bluish. So I'm going to glaze this, put some glazing fluid here. I just wiped off the excess paint off of this brush, so get that on here. It's got a bit of a purplish quality to it. That's okay.
almost fear the background is now too dark. <laughs> I'm going to take this same color. <clears throat> I'm going to put it I'm taking the same color that I had this brown, just gonna get a little bit of that blue in here. Okay, getting there. I'm going to blow dry everything. <clears throat> I'll just show you them side by side. Okay, we're getting there, getting there. Just got to keep the train running. I'm going to do uh, the same dark glaze over top of the background again. Let's get some more warm blue in here. That ultramarine blue is, is quite transparent, so um, it's going to put a bit of glazing fluid in there anyway.
I don't know about this. This was maybe a bit of a was getting a little going too fast. Let me see if I can just scrape a bit of it off because it's I just put a maybe a bit too much on there, so I kind of obliterated. the subtlety in that jacket that I've been building up for the past few hours, right? I don't see many of the folds, so I'm just going to take my rag, just wipe off some of that excess, and then I'm just going to kind of go th over this. <clears throat> Wiping off excess paint here. Ah, this rag just starts falling apart. Of course it does, right? As they always say, accidents happen when you're closest to home. So just when you think you're nearing completion, that's when everything starts to go a bit haywire. Uh, that was a pretty bold gesture that um, we'll let that dry for a few minutes while that's drying let's go back up into the top here let's put the name in there what do I say I got 12 minutes uh, of course I'm not gonna make that but uh, we'll get close so for that color up there I'm going to take some of this blue, kind of brownish, ugly color, and we're just going to mix a bunch of white into it. I don't want to have pure white, because it's just going to be too bright. So let's just take actually a bunch of that white, mix it in here, and we've got a kind of grayish color, right? I'm going to actually blow dry all this just because there's just so much wet paint on here. I want to be able to rest my hand on the picture. Okay, so you see, I've got the color that I want, um, and it's as dark as I want it, but I've lost a lot of the detail just because I went 
10 steps further in this whole glazing process with the jacket. So a lot of that beautiful subtlety that I was slowly building up has been lost. It's okay because I'm gonna, I still wanna darken in here. So I'm gonna come back and kind of fudge it, but I've lost a little bit of those details just because of, again, going as fast as I've been going. Um, so let's go up into the top and see if I can see any of the text up there. So when I see a little bit on the edges, I can see some of the letters. It's not ideal. But that's what helps when you know, you're using a bit of texture in your paint. So what I can do is work from what I can see. So I can see this N here. I mean, I could just, you know, write it wherever I want at this point. Oh, goodness, you can't even see what I'm doing. Ah. serifs on the text there. It's interesting. I wonder what the purpose of him writing this text on here was. And if this is the copy he kept for himself, that is really strange. It's, it's quite unusual to see um, a name on a painting like that. <clears throat> so I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea what uh, his thought process was.
Okay, so I can. S I'm going to work my way backwards because I can see the S right here. But that's really only the only thing I can see in this. So, we got a V, I think, right here. So I'm going to try to keep them roughly the same height. Getting a bit of paint elsewhere on the painting, so I'm going to have to do some touch-ups there shortly. don't like how close I'm getting to this head. Texas is slowly getting bigger and bigger, which is... Uh. out and we'll look at them side by side <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. so there's a few little things like this paint here so that's my 45 minute timer that's when I was hoping to be wrapping up right now let's just see if I can Okay, 
Uh, I need a darker color. My darkest color that I can get uh, is going to be rather than just resorting to some black. Let's get cool blue. Warm red. Mix this together real quick. Actually, that looks even a little bit darker, doesn't it? I think I am going to break out the black. It's not, he probably would have used black as well. I just always want to avoid it at all cost, but uh, I'll put some black in here because I need to get darker and darker and darker. So let's actually put, I'll put a bit of glaze in there so not quite so intense. And I'm going to take this black and again I'm going to go kind of around in his jacket area here. This means I'm going to have to put some black elsewhere in the painting. I think it's you probably can't see much on your screen right now. I would be surprised if you can see this, but uh, that also means that these folds have to be darkened as well. So I just took some more black and glazing fluid here. And let's I guess I need a bit more. Take this and also just go right into his beard.
Okay, I'm going to blow dry that and we're going to do another layer of this. We'll zoom in on the face so you can see. It's this gets a little bit dangerous when you're doing fast glazes like this because I'm not being very patient. The likelihood I'll I'll, I'll do things I'm not happy with is going up very quickly. <laughs> you generally just want to take your time. I always talk about glazing as sort of the the timid painter's best friend because you can go really nice and slow at your own pace slowly darkening or brightening things because you don't just have to use glaze for brightening or for darkening things you can also use glazes for adding highlights which we're going to do here in a second a little bit more on this face What color are these eyes? It's mm, kind of a brown, aren't they? a little bit lazy with that too <clears throat> See those eyebrows are too dark. So I'm taking black, almost undiluted, and just going into this beard on the side and on his hair.
<coughs> okay. I'm also just quickly. <laughs> See how dark it is. <coughs> So let's put a little bit more uh, color back on his face. Actually, I gotta clean a bunch of brushes here. Things are getting kind of dirty. And as much as I wanna just race to the finish, I think I just need a second just to kind of slow down, take a second. Clean a few things up. <clears throat> One of my favorite quotes of all time, I've mentioned it a few times, is slow down, we're in a hurry. Right? It's one of my favorite things. That it's, I think a chef said it. I can't remember where I, I, I read that. In one book, I, <laughs> one of the, I, I love reading all sorts of different kinds of books. I have a note somewhere where I wrote down that quote. But it's always stuck in my mind as sort of like great wisdom is... Uh, as much as I want to get this painting done as quickly as possible, if I keep racing, it's going to it's going to fall apart. So uh, I will finish it in short time here. Let's do a bit of bring back a little bit of the highlights in this jacket here. So put some white down. And then Get a bit on this brush. I just want to get a little bit of color on here. And then we'll again wipe that off. And should I do this as with this large brush? I'm not sure. I may even, let's jump to this. Or no, I think I need to see. So I'm gonna use my blending brush. that's coming across on camera at all but
You see, so what would have been a better method just to take my time and do many glazes here? Because I'm still having to kind of go back and and do work in this area, right? So whenever you think you're cutting a corner, there's always kind of pay a price for it, right? I'm just gonna. Eh. Maybe I'll just have to walk away from this part of the jacket. This is just my darker color coming in and just trimming some of this down just a bit. What's disappointing is it I'm sure it doesn't you can't see it on camera but this black that I've I've mixed into the color it's just really flattening everything and I I know I it's to be expected because this is why I barely use black ever to be for this exact reason but anyway okay so I think I just need a little bit more highlights on the face and then we'll call it a day. So, I think I can still use some of this. It's still a bit wet, that's okay. Some glazing food. So let's uh, get just a few quick little highlights.
should have a bit more yellow, warm yellow in it, shouldn't it? on these ears. Sorry for the sniffles again. Um, I hear my wife getting the bath ready for our daughter. the question. Let's take a look at this hand. Oh, I didn't even notice he had a ring there. 
Let's see. Yeah, you know, I could work on this for hours more, but not happy with that lip. Let's get a bit of warm red. So I'm going to get a bit of warm red, just to kind of dilute it a little bit in the skin color. So I don't want to just put a bright warm red on the lips, otherwise it'll look silly. dive back in come on focus having a difficult time focusing on this. Maybe it needs to be in the center. Let's try that again. Okay, I'm going to darken that red a bit. Let's get a bit of... So we got some of the brighter red. Before we finish up, we'll put a little bit of white pop on the eyes. Uh -uh. Tiny little dots to give it a little bit of extra life. Whew, okay. So. I'm going to 
let's zoom back out. See them side by side. I'd love to do more and more and more here, but I gotta call it a day. Pretty close to the original. Good enough for government work, as my grandfather always used to say. One of the greatest paintings in a Canadian collection of all time. Oh, what's happening here? I'm not even sure. Let me know in the chat if this is still going out live. I see. I'm having, oh, there we go. Okay. That's good. Whew. For a second, I thought there was something catastrophic happened and it ended, but it was just a glitch on the computer here. Okay. So. Um. So let's uh, sign this one here. This, by the way, is the 400, to, literally today is the 445th anniversary of the death of Titian. 445 years ago. He made this painting about, what would it be, f about 475 years ago. Exactly. That's, I mean, <laughs> it's never, there's no way that I was going to make, recreate that masterpiece in three and a half hours and for it to, to be anywhere near as great as the original, but I'm not too bummed out about these results here. I'm, I'm quite I'm reasonably satisfied with the, the way that I've rendered the face. Down here in the clothes, maybe less so, but I, I think that's almost invisible to most people anyway. So only if you've got really good lighting would you see some of these, uh, the sloppiness that I did down here. The text up there, again, a little bit, it was in a bit of a hurry. And every time I start rushing those those details that require precision, you're going to get what uh, your the painting is going to slap you back. So... There we go. Okay. So, if you enjoyed today's episode, please like, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. We're going to be doing a special episode on Sunday in honor of the birthday, uh, or to celebrate the birthday of astronaut Chris Hatfield. He's the guy who played guitar and sung uh, Space Odyssey, David Bowie's song in space, if you remember that from a few years ago. He's a personal hero of mine. I've had the chance to meet him briefly and read his books. And he's also releasing a new book on in October, uh, a, a fiction novel. So now that he's literally gone out of this world, He's turned his attention to writing books. He's, he's written a few great books, non-fiction books, about his experience in space, but now he's, he's, writing a, he's writing a Cold War thriller. So I look forward to making that painting on Sunday, on Chris Hatfield's birthday. And uh, yeah, if you want to leave a donation, there's a link to PayPal below. I would love to uh, receive any donation, large or small, help support the channel and 
all of this is all due to your support so i really appreciate all of those of you who have generously supported my work here uh, day after day thank you everyone we'll see you guys in a few days enjoy your um your weekend until then lots of great videos i also posted links to the upcoming videos for the next couple of weeks so be sure to hit the notification bell on those so you won't miss them when you log into youtube you're not having frantically looking around for them they'll be very easy they'll pop right up as soon as you open up the app or the website we'll see you guys in a few days okay everyone take care good night <laughs>